Thank you, Pat. Well, good morning, everyone. Wow, this reminds me of my old church uh, in uh, British Columbia on the west coast just outside of Vancouver. Um, We bought an old Kingdom Hall. You know, you've heard of those before. Didn't have any windows in it, but you got a couple of windows. Uh, They had windows in the bathroom. I don't understand what that was all about. But anyways, uh, it's good to be here with you this morning. My wife, Cheryl, is at the back. And uh, wave, Cheryl. Uh, And two of my kids, my adult kids, are here. They love Arizona. Well, my son apparently loves Arizona. And, uh, but they got in really late last night, and so uh, they're coming to the next service uh, to help us out. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a real joy to be here. First time I've ever been here in Arizona. And, um, you know, I believe that the world has become a mission field everywhere nowadays. I mean, even this area of Casa Grande is probably a mission field from what I can see in just my short time here. And uh, uh, I have always appreciated Pat's ministry. We were two hours away. He was in Oakville, which is outside of Toronto, and I was in London, the other London, uh, Canada. And uh, we would get together oh, probably once a month, every two months, and we'd uh, go to the Chuck Wagon restaurant and have breakfast together. And uh, it was great uh, just, you know, sharing what the Lord was doing and encouraging one another. And there's not a lot of Calvary chapels up in Canada. Um, <clears throat> so everybody knows everybody up there. Well, I've been up there for a number of years, and part of my mission has uh, been church planting. So we church planted on the West Coast outside of Vancouver. And uh, back in the late 90s, we started, and then some churches came out of us. And then <clears throat> about eight years ago, the Lord called us to Ontario, uh, London, Ontario, which is about two hours from Toronto, two hours from Detroit, All right, just so you know where it is. And it's very different weather there right now. It's frozen, it's ice, it's cold, and so it's it's nice to be in this weather. But for years, the Lord has been challenging me with the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And uh, for years, I just thought, well, I'll just plant a church. I'll do it in my local, local neighborhood. But then the Lord started sending guys out from our church, and then one thing led to another. Uh, We started uh, going overseas a little bit to India and Nepal and um, Sri Lanka and all all these different places, and eventually Kenya, Myanmar, planted the first Calvary chapels in Bangladesh, a few years ago, which was pretty exciting, one of the most Muslim nations in the entire world. And uh, um, for quite a while, though, we were just supporting with Gospel for Asia. Have you guys heard of that before? All right, yeah. (laughs) You probably heard about it, yes, I'm sure. I was very involved with it on the Canadian side. I spoke at their headquarters in Canada, and and, uh, we supported um, at least 50 missionaries. We put 50 pictures of missionaries on the back that we supported in our church. And, um, and of course, you know the story how they kind of made some changes and the founders uh, sort of separated, gone a different route. He's gone back more to his orthodox roots, you know, which is kind of like Catholic, if you will. But uh, he uh, set in place 12 bishops. I'm telling you a story here because it's pretty miraculous what happened. He put 12, ordained 12 bishops to be over the whole organization. The largest, it was really the largest missions organization in India some uh, 20 to 30,000 churches and preaching points based on Calvary Chapel, all right? It was based on Calvary Chapel is what it was. And so um, anyways, these 12 guys were running the whole thing, and uh, three of them broke away. And one of them jumped on a plane a few years ago and came to all places, London, Canada. And through just a miraculous chain of events, I ended up meeting this guy, Nobody else really wanted to get, you know, get together with him. And uh, he says, look, we've got all these pastors who, um, they're very evangelical. They're very Bible-based. They want some help. They, they, they've heard of Calvary Chapel. They like Calvary Chapel. They want to be part of Calvary Chapel in, in the sense of how they teach through the word verse by verse. And so I got together with this guy for about 10 days in a coffee shop every day. And I shared him some of the training materials that I take people through, that I take leaders through. And he was very, very excited about it, shared my vision. And uh, long story short is uh, there's about 150 guys in India and Sri Lanka and Nepal who are pastors that we've come alongside just in those three countries that we've been working with for the last little while. And uh, we've been helping them spiritually, uh, 
you know, with uh, material training and uh, also with, um, um, also with uh, just uh, financial aid, actually. So uh, do we have pictures? Do we have those slides? All right. <clears throat> so here's a picture of me with some of the leadership over there. All right. And this was my last trip before the pandemic. And this is two of the bishops. They call themselves bishops because they use the King James word, you know. All right. And, and uh, so that's two of the guys. Anyways, very excited. I just want you to know there's 150 pastors in India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal that are praying for your church this morning and praying specifically for this service. They told me they're praying and some of them are going to be fasting for you guys and asking the Lord to speak to uh, uh, the people here in Calvary Chapel, Casa Grande. Um, is it Casa Grande or Casa Grande? Oh, is there a problem here? <laughs> I've heard it both ways. I'm kind of torn. All right. Anyways, <clears throat> um, here's the thing. Uh, if you think it's tough here in North America, America, Canada, that uh, for the last two years that you've had to put on a mask or you've had to take a vaccine or you haven't been able to travel or anything like that, uh, you know, think of what is going on over there in some of these places, all right? I mean, it is difficult in these places on a good day, never mind what's happened over the last two years. And you think inflation has gone up here? <laughs> inflation over there has gone up. We, we complain about how our houses have gone up, you know, double the price in three years. Well, bag, a bag of rice has gone up quite a bit over there. Now think about that. You know, we struggle with one thing. They have, we have first world tr troubles and they have uh, third world troubles, if we can call it that. What's the next slide? Oh, so in Kenya, we got involved. We do some pastor training, but... Um, one of Cheryl's relatives uh, started an orphanage about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and uh, they're uh, getting on in years, and they asked us to take it over. So this is one of the buildings. They have 10 acres, and turn to the next one. And, uh, you know, they're quite nice buildings, actually. These, these were the schools that they built. Uh, and then the next slide. And so uh, there's a number of kids. They've had up to 100 children. There's Cheryl. We do a VBS. We were there last about two and a half years ago. We're going back again this April, God willing because um, the restrictions have left. And uh, we love these kids, man. They really are amazing. Uh, the next slide, if you can. And uh, there they are there. And we started uh, a little Calvary Chapel there uh, on the uh, children's home called Calvary Chapel Catala. You can see the sign in the back. All right, so there's some kids and some adults there. All right, and the next slide. And uh, there's a pastor's conference that we did right there in the building. So we're going to use the facility to train pastors on a regular basis. Isn't that exciting? And not Calvary Chapel pastors, anybody that wants to come. We don't care. We said, just come. It's for free. We're not going to give you any money, guys. But we're going to just come, and we'll give you materials, and we'll train you. And uh, they, I, this last thing that we did with them, they were so appreciative because a lot of them, they have no Bible college training. They have no training, all right, in a lot of these rural areas. And uh, the fact that somebody would come and just invest in them for a week, <clears throat> give them a place to stay, give them food, and and, um, and say, look, we'll come back and do some more with you. Uh, they, I can't tell you how appreciative they were. I mean, I just don't have the words, all right, to, to talk about um, how in incredibly blessed they felt. Anyways, long story short is um, things have been challenging, and we've been sponsoring out, uh, trying to find sponsors for the kids and trying to find sponsors for these missionaries in India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Uh, we've got a table at the back, or uh, on the other side of the doors here, in the foyer. Do you call it a foyer here? Is it a foyer? Yeah? A foyer? Foyer. All right. Z. Z. All right. All right. So anyways, I'm just kidding. Uh, so you can uh, talk to Cheryl afterwards, and she'll help you out. And, um, you know, just for $35 a month, uh, you can help sponsor a pastor in one of these countries, or you can help sponsor uh, one of these kids and we do discipleship training with these kids that's important for you to know our next step is to raise up a, a, two of the kids that have graduated who are older to turn them into youth pastors to stay there and work with the kids full time and to work with some of the other children's homes in the area as well that's kind of exciting isn't it so uh, you know um, I wish the Lord had to put this desire in my heart 10 years ago when I had a, a larger church 
you know, uh, when we were on the west coast of Canada, you know, we had a couple hundred people, nice building, I, uh, Pacific Ocean, a stone throw away from my office. But then the Lord called us to, uh, you know, the eastern part of Canada while we're church planning. He puts this idea of a ministry on my heart. And so I thought, well, the only way it's going to go forward is if other churches join hands and uh, we go forward together. But sometimes I think that's a good thing. The Lord sort of humbles you in order for you to go forward. All right. And uh, a lot of times I feel like a little speck of dust on a grain of sand called earth. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I just feel like, I, what can I possibly do, possibly do to make a difference? It's amazing that God uses any of us, any of us, in the ways that he does. It reminds me of the story of, uh, remember the little boy who had, uh, what was it, five loaves and two fishes? Right? And he, the Lord fed 5,000 because the Lord can multiply our efforts many times over. And this church here in Casa Grande, um, God can use you in big ways to impact the world. And that's all there is to it. So I'm going to talk this morning. You guys are at Calvary Chapel, so I hear you like teach going through the word, right? All right, well, get your Bibles out. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV 84, uh, because us Canadians don't know any better. But uh, I will uh, be talking a little bit um, about the New King James Version as we go through, too, because I, I love that translation as well. But let's pray. Father, I pray as we get into the Word that you would help me to speak clearly, help us to hear clearly what your Holy Spirit would say. I pray you would challenge our hearts. I pray this be a time where it would be a, just a communion between each and every one of us and you. Uh, I pray it would be like a conversation, God, between you and us as we go through the word. I pray there would be something at some point, even if it's just one sentence, that would speak to every single person. A different sentence probably, but something that would speak to each and every one of us. Use this time. We need you to speak through your word, Father, in a fresh way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, so we are in 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to be speaking a little bit about discipleship. And specifically, I would call this uh, message the spiritual athlete. The spiritual athlete. Now, there are, it's been said that there are three areas where most people are tempted. Sex, silver, and sloth. Sex, silver, and sloth. Have you ever heard that before? Well, there's another one called Girls, Gold, and Glory, but I'll, that's another sermon. <laughs> this is sex, silver, and sloth. And it seems that a good number of church leaders have and are giving into temptations of the flesh, of uh, non-marital sex or the scandalous use of money. And it's even more unfortunate when the secular news media gets a hold of this and it makes our disgraces uh, as a church uh, very evident, makes it look even bigger. But I believe there's an even more serious problem going within the church, a greater sin that the media has never picked up on. And it is the temptation that we all face daily, that of spiritual sloth. Spiritual sloth. Now, when I say sloth, it means, you know, a certain spiritual lethargy, a certain spiritual laziness, a sluggishness. And a sloth, there's an actual animal called a sloth. Have you ever seen a sloth? I think I got a picture here. Let's show that picture of a sloth. And here's a sloth, cute little guy. They got these long, you know, hooks kind of thing. And uh, we got another picture too. There he's hanging out. And if you've ever seen them move, they move very slowly, Right? I mean, they move really, really slow. And you wonder how in the world they could possibly survive in the wild. I mean, there's so many animals out there that would eat them. And I've seen them crawling across roads. And it's like it takes a while for them to cross across a road. Never mind a turtle. The turtle would win. These guys <laughs> deserve their name. They are spiritual sloth. And so 
That's an example of what it looks, what laziness looks like, what sluggishness uh, looks like. Spiritual laziness, spiritual sloth is what we all have to do with on a regular basis. Every, now, maybe not the 8.30 service, but definitely the 10.30 service. Okay? I think you got... No, I'm just kidding. I'll change the joke for later on, all right? So, Anyways, here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul challenged young Timothy with the metaphor of being an athlete. And some translations bring this out really clear. Some, will, will, you have to work through it a little bit. But Paul used the example of an athlete to represent the Christian life. And his challenge to young Timothy was, be as serious, be as committed, be as disciplined in the Christian life as an athlete training in sports. And so really you could say that this chapter has language in it of a spiritual athlete. I'm going to point out certain words to you, and you can underline them and all that. But the first thing I draw your attention to is in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, something you're uh, very familiar with, I think. But uh, look what Paul says to Timothy. He says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly or exercise, as the New King James says, does it not? Exercise yourself to be God towards godliness. Verse 8, for physical training is of some value or little value. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so, verse, the second part of verse 7, train yourself, exercise yourself towards godliness. That word train or exercise, that's a good word to underline, by the way. It is the Greek word gymnasia. Now, have you heard, do you think that sounds like an English word? Yeah, it does. It's like, a, we, that's where we get our English word, gymnasium. And so this, and whether you realize it or not, this chapter's filled with hints of the athletic. There's athletic words here. And really, actually, the first six verses talk about food. Actually, they it talks about physical food, actual physical food you put in your mouth. And... Uh, the doctrine that the false teachers were teaching about physical food. But then Paul turns that around, and he uses that as, as an example, as an illustration. And Paul says, you know, doctrine itself is a type of food. All right? So bear with, follow with me as we go through this. So Paul starts off with some very sobering words in verse 1. He says, the Spirit clearly says, or expressly says, that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons, or doctrines of demons. Some will abandon the faith. Now, in the original language, that word abandon, we get our English word apostasy. If you were to look at that word, you would see, you know, oh, that kind of looks like the English word apostasy or to apostatize. The word abandon or, or to depart means to fall away from. And it literally means someone who moves from an originally held position. So they hold this position, but then they move away from that position. And as Paul wrote this, I'm sure he had in mind the two fellows that he mentioned earlier in chapter 1, verse 20. Alexander and Hymenaeus. These two fellows were causing a real issue in this church that Timothy was pastoring and that Paul was writing to. And he mentions them by name, chapter 1, verse 20. The, these guys had apostatized. They had abandoned the faith. And uh, in, it actually says in chapter 1, verse 20, that they had shipwrecked their faith on the rocks. They had faith, but it was shipwrecked. Now, um, most of you, probably all of you, don't realize something about me, but about 12, 13 years ago, I wanted to get in shape physically. You know, one morning I looked in the mirror, and, uh, well, I looked like I kind of look now, but, uh, <laughs> but I said, you know, I was eating poorly, I was, wasn't exercising, I was a little overweight, and I decided to start going in, 
and uh, working out in the gym. So for about two, it was a rough start, but after about two, for about two or three years, I was going in like four or five times a week. I was working out for 45 minutes, 60 minutes a day. I mean, I was slimming out. I was, mu- I was muscular, well, more muscular. Um, I was like 30, 40 pounds less than what I am right now. And uh, I, I mean, it was going really good. And then we got, I got in a car accident. And um, threw everything off. I mean, it just, and we're finally getting around to where we, you know, well, I just had a hip replacement, which was part of the whole car car accident from years ago, all right? So now I'm just starting to get my mind around, let's go back to that sort of thing. But here's the thing, holding to a position and then moving away from it. You're in great shape, you're doing well, you're exercising, and then you fall away from it. And that's what he's saying here. And so by the time we get to the last verse, here in chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, uh, he's going to say, watch your life and doctrine closely, or take heed to yourself. Take heed. Look at yourself carefully. Examine yourself carefully. That's That's what an athlete does. Persevere in them. Continue in them. Watch your doctrine. Discipline your life closely. And so Paul here speaks here in verse 1, first of all, he talks about deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, or things taught by demons. And he goes on to describe the, the uh, spiritual diet of these false teachers in verse 2. He says in verse 2, such teachings come through hypocr- hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, again, Paul uses another word here in this verse. It's it's actually a medical term. Uh, The word seared, their consciences are seared. The original word there, if you were to look at it in the Greek, would look like our English word cauterize. Now, do you know what it is to cauterize something? Uh, Most of you have probably seen a, a war movie or some sort of movie where somebody gets wounded or cut. And what do they do in the movie? They heat up a knife in the fire, and then what? They put it on the wound, and you hear a sizzle, all right? And then, of course, the guy's really good in about 10 minutes. It's not really like that in real life. But to cauterize something is where uh, where you burn the skin or the flesh with a heated instrument to stop the wound from bleeding or to stop infection. That's what it means to cauterize. And afterwards, it leaves a bit of a scar. It leaves some scar tissue. And that area, the skin is thicker. If you have any kind of scar, actually, the skin is usually thicker, and it loses a little bit of its sensitivity. That's what he's getting at here. Paul says these false teachers have lost their spiritual sensitivity. Their consciences have been seared, cauterized. Their consciences have become callous. They were so convinced that they were right, that their conscience didn't bother them. And that's what you'll find when you deal with people in different cults like the Mormons or the JWs or any other cult that's out there. They're so, so convinced and sure that they're right, but they have a seared conscience. Their conscience has been seared as with a hot iron. Now, iron, I should say. Verse 3 goes on and it says, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Down through the history of Christianity, there has always been false teaching. There's always been movements or individuals of false teaching. In the first century, Paul always seemed to be at odds with this group called the Judaizers. All right? And uh, they forbade certain pe- they forbade people from eating certain foods. They they demanded that the Gentiles live like the Jews. They demanded the Gentiles get circumcised, do, do various Old Testament rites, and basically you had to become Jewish before you bec- could become Christian. Okay, and, and we see this nowadays. Actually, there's a new movement. It's not really a new movement, but it's called the Hebrew Roots Movement. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, the Hebrew Roots Movement, well, for many it starts off with discovering your Jewish roots, you know, within Christianity, which is good and I'm all for, but then it turns into 
you have to become Jewish before you can become Christian. Very same thing all over again. And so Paul, once again, he lays out this theology of food. Believe it or not, a theology of food. Can you believe that? He lays out a theology of food. Verses 4 and 5, look what he says. He says, For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Really, the struggle in the early church was with legalism, you know, trying to live by certain laws to get God's favor. I got to try harder. I got to do better. And it's never good enough. Now, in Ephesus, which, by the way, is where Timothy was pastoring. You know, we think about the church in Ephesus. Uh, we think of the book of Ephesians. But really, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy is like, you know, 1 Ephesians and 2 Ephesians. Did you know that? So it's writing. He's writing to Timothy, who has been sent to deal with the false teachers in the city of Ephesus, in the church in Ephesus. But uh, it wasn't just legalism that they were dealing with in that church. They were dealing with something called asceticism a form of severe self-discipline that saw food and marriage as evil. Asceticism, just a real um, severe treatment of the physical body. And of course, you see it in some places in the world, like in the Philippines, you see some people who beat their bodies with whips. All right, that's a form of asceticism. All right, so uh, these, these rules, they look holy, they look devout, they look spiritual. These, these rules, they look spiritual to some people. But really, Paul says, this stuff, these doctrines you're teaching, they're demonic. They look spiritual. Oh, they're, they're spiritual. It's the wrong kind of spirit. And uh, they're, they're not, it's not good spiritual food. It's spiritual junk food. Now, do you guys like a bag of chips every now and then and a can of Coke? Yeah. It's junk food. And if you eat too much of that, it's poison to your body. Even a little bit is poison to your body. But the thing is this. Paul says here in these verses, he says, all food is good. Physical food. Marriage is good. God created these things. Well, verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus brought up or nourished in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Now, the NIV here says brought up in the truths of the faith, but the New King James, or the King James, says nourished in the words of faith. Nourished in the words of God. See, the false teachers, they had all these teachings about food. Don't touch this, don't touch that. But Paul was basically saying, Timothy, listen, Timothy, this is important. Theologically, there's good, healthy food, and theologically, there's junk food. And if you want to be a good spiritual athlete, you have to watch your diet carefully. You have to feed yourself good food. I mean, an athlete, he eats the right food. He, uh, he, he, he's very careful about what his diet consists of. You ever been around, ever seen a diet, someone really into it? They're weighing stuff on the scale. They're reading the ingredients. They're getting organic. They're doing all these things, vitamins, all right? They avoid liquor and drugs and, and especially junk food. Um, and you've got to be very careful nowadays, especially if you're in Olympics, because uh, certain drugs will disqualify you because it looks like some sort of hormone or something, unless you're a Russian athlete, I guess. But anyways... I'll talk about that in a minute. Anyways, you know, the Christian is to be nourished, to be brought up in the truths of the faith, in the, in the words of God. And that's what he says. Back in chapter 3, the previous chapter, verse 9, he says, uh, leaders were to hold on to the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, until you are nourished by the word of God, until you have a, a real hold on the truths of the faith, the deep truths of the faith, it is very difficult to combat false teaching. It is very difficult to combat legalism and asceticism and uh, all these winds of doctrine that blow through the church. You've got to get a hold of the Word of God, and then you've got to get a hold of the truths that are in there and understand why they're there. In 1 Peter 2.2, 2, the Apostle Peter says, Crave the pure spiritual milk of the Word, 
The problem in Ephesus, where Timothy was pastoring, was that the people were feeding on spiritual junk food. <clears throat> Paul called it godless myths and old wives' tales. So the first six verses that we have just gone over are all about doctrine, good doctrine and bad doctrine. And the false teachers had false teaching about physical food itself, which is interesting. But then, you know, Paul takes that and he turns it around. I love how he does this. He turns it around and he says, you know, doctrine itself and the word itself is like food. It's spiritual food and you get nourished on it. So do you see what he's doing here? Very cool. Paul is very good, you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to do these things in Scripture. Well, let's take a look at verses 7 and 8 that we already read. And this is kind of the key verses for this chapter. He says in verse 7, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train or exercise yourself to be godly. Gymnasia is the word for train, as we said. Physical training, there it is again. Physical training, gymnasia, is good has some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, when you visit the ruins in Ephesus, has anybody ever been to Ephesus? All right, yeah, I mean, we usually do an uh, a Israel tour, but we, one time we decided to do the uh, uh, Footsteps of Paul and the Seven Churches of Revelation. And so we ended up uh, in the city of Ephesus. And when you go there, it really is quite the amazing old city. It's ruins, but uh, there's a lot to see there. Anyways, when you visit the ruins of Ephesus today, uh, you can go stand in the actual area, the space, where there used to be gymnasiums in the city. They had a couple of gymnasiums there. In fact, I brought a little piece of rock back. I don't know if that's allowed, but anyways, you know, I, and I still have it. I go, this is from, and I think of this saying here in uh, verses 7 and 8, train yourself to be godly, gymnasia. See, here's the thing. There's a couple of these gymnasiums right on the main corridor, the main street in Ephesus. And every day when Timothy would walk through Ephesus, he would walk past these gymnasiums and he would be reminded of these verses. Timothy, train yourself. Exercise yourself to be godly. Every day he would look and he'd say, oh yeah, Paul told me about that. I better exercise. I need to do some spiritual exercise here, if you will. And so Timothy walked past these gymnasiums every single day and, and, and reminded, gymnasia, train yourself to be godly. Now, um, Timothy, not only are you to train yourself, but you're also to realize that you are in God's gymnasium. Did you know the church is a spiritual gymnasium. Did you know that? It is. There, there's spiritual exercise that's going on here. There's some, you know, there's some commitment and discipline for you to be here, to be a part of this. Train yourself to be godly. Now, I would suggest to you that the main disciplines within the Christian faith are being in the Word, prayer, fellowship, and witnessing. Now, I know there's other things that we can tag in there, spiritual gifts, serving, tithing, all these things. But those four areas, there's a lot. You can put a lot under them as subsections. And if I were to draw a picture, and I think I got a picture here, that represents the Christian life, I would draw a picture of a wheel. Have you seen this before? Where Christ is the center, where we're living a life of absolute surrender, and you're living in the, the world, which is the obedient Christian life where the rubber hits the road. And, you know, you have that up and down relationship with uh, God through the word and through prayer. That's how you're connected with God. That's how you love God with all your heart. And then you have a relationship with believers, fellowship, and non-believers witnessing. And that's how you love people. And uh, obedience, as we're obedient to Jesus, where the rubber hits the road in life, um, basically, these things, we go forward in the Christian life, actually. And, of course, the center of a wheel where the power is on your car is not in the tire. It's where? It's in the center. It's where the hub is, right? Where it attaches to the axles, to the motor. Anyways, that's, if, if I were to 
put up a picture and say, this is the basics of the Christian life. That would be it. In fact, I would say this is not just the basics. I would say this is the essentials. Because whether you're 20 years old or 80 or 90 years old, you will always have to be in the place of the word and prayer and fellowship and witness, will you not? It's not the basics. This is the absolute essentials. With Christ being the center and being obedient and fruitful to Jesus on the outside. That's what I would call a six-pack. All right? You've heard about six-packs before? All right? That's the spiritual muscle six-pack right there. Okay, we could take that down. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to have discipline, if you will, but grace-based dis discipline. And I think this is what Paul was hitting at here. Train yourself to be godly. Take it with the same seriousness of a committed athlete. Look at the athlete. Don't get sucked in and trapped and, you know, fall for junk, spiritual junk food. Diet is so incredibly important, along with a certain amount of commitment and effort that comes from us. But it's all about grace as well. Now, moving on, let's take a look. Let's get into the word. Verse 8, I want to read it again. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Physical training has some value. It's true. It's good to get out and have a walk after dinner, isn't it? Get some fresh air. Uh, but godly training has promise for this life and forever. The payoff is eternal dividends. The payoff is out of this world. Nowadays, our society is very concerned about the development of the physical body, is it not? It's all about gym memberships and working out. And, and for the most part, it has little concern about the development of the soul. But when it does think about the development of the soul, it never thinks about the church. And that's unfortunate. I, and I think part of the reason is because we don't talk about discipleship anymore. Uh, we don't talk about the spiritual disciplines. And don't get me wrong. Listen, salvation is free. But discipleship is going to cost you everything. Because that's what Jesus said. No one can be my disciple unless he deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So salvation is free by the grace of God. But then, you know, God starts to call you and shows you what that's all about, following him. Verses 9 and 10. Let's continue on. This is a trustworthy saying that de deserves full acceptance. And for this we labor and strive, that we have put our faith, put our hope, sorry, in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. Now, there's some debate about what is meant by the faithful saying. Is it the verses before, you know, train yourself to be godly, or is it the verses after where he says, God wants all men to be saved, um, God is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. But here's the deal. God is the Savior of all men. And when it says all in my Bible, I think all means all, don't you? All means all. But especially of us because we have received it, and it's ours, and we know what it's all about. But now that you have been saved, God says, train yourself to be godly. The, re the reason you were saved was so that you could become like Jesus. And when the, it uses the word godly, it really means Christ-like. Train yourself to be Christ-like, to be like Jesus in your character. Well, there's a lot of ways you could define his character, but I always go to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know them, right? Let me ask you something. What's the first one again? Love. Who was the most loving human being that ever walked on this planet, ever? Jesus, are we agreed? All right. Next one is joy. Who was the most joyful human being that ever walked on this planet? Who would it have to be? Yeah, it, it is Jesus. He had the joy of the Lord in his heart. Love, joy, peace. Who was the most peaceful human being ever to walk on this planet? You sure? He is the Prince of Peace. You can go all through nine, now those nine fruit of the Spirit. And we often think, oh, that's for the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. That's the result of Jesus being the center of your heart and your life. He's your Lord. And you will become more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient, more kind, 
more self-controlled, disciplined, if you will, as you get closer to Jesus and he becomes the center of your life and you're living that fruitful life. But here's the thing. The reason you have been saved is not so that you can live your life in selfishness. No, you've been saved so that you can go out and live your life for the purpose of Jesus, to become like Jesus, which you were originally created to be. This is an accept, uh, a saying that deserves full acceptance. They call it the five faithful sayings. I have another sermon, by the way, called the five faithful sayings. If, if Pat ever invites me back, that'll be the one I go to because I, I love sharing that one, and it's very challenging. But notice some of the athletics here in verses 9 and 10 that I read. He says, we labor, we strive, we labor, we toil, we exhaust ourselves. Uh, the word strive and labor here, the, one, one of those words is agonizo. Sounds like our English word what? To agonize. Right? We labor, we strive to make this known. That is what God has called us to. To make this known to the world. That he is the savior of all men. And that we are to become like Jesus. It's so important. Verses 11 and 12. Let's continue on. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Back then in that culture, if you were under the age of 40, you were considered a young man. Now, Timothy, because of his young age, and because of the difficult situation he was in, in Ephesus with all these false teachers taking shots at him, <laughs> Paul has to say, don't let any of these guys look down on you because you're younger than them. Paul says, nope. Don't let them do it. Not for a minute. Challenge it. Right then and there. Tell them to knock it off. But then he says, be an example. Verse 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Training has a certain amount of devotion. And he says here, devote yourself, commit yourself to the preaching and the teaching of the Word. Because that really was his gift, as you see later, you know, in the context of uh, First and Second Timothy. Now, verse fourteen goes on. It says, "Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you." I like that right there. Do not neglect your gift. Do not neglect your gift. Do you know that every man, woman, and child right now in this room, every single one of you have a gift. Some of you have more than one gift, but you have a gift. Do not neglect your gift. Back when I was in high school, I wouldn't say I was like a great athlete. I was kind of middle of the team kind of athlete. But I had a buddy that we went through all the grades together and he had a genetic gift. He was born with the, the genetics, the DNA of an athlete. Do you know what I mean? I mean, for it just he was born with it. I would go on those long runs, you know. Back then we called it mile-long runs. And at the end of it, I, my lungs were on fire. I felt like I was going to die. I felt like I was going to pass out. He would come in, and he was ready to go for the second mile. We'd take our heartbeat, and my heartbeat would be racing way up there, and his was like 60 beats per minute. I mean, his, his oxygen recovery and everything, it was just really quite amazing. But here's the thing. I mean, even though he was four steps ahead of everybody else, he didn't even have to work at it. And we were on some of these teams together. And as we got into high school, he started to get into the party and scene, and he started smoking, and he started drinking. And here's the thing is he was still better than most of us. But he neglected his gift. He could have developed that so much more, went so much further. But he got lazy. He just kind of rested on his laurels, if you know what I mean. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing better than most of you. Why would I need to develop it? He, and he didn't. He just kind of went with it. Here's the thing. Do not neglect your gift, guys. God has given you something. And you may be even really good at it, but he's calling you to develop it more. Verse 15, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Be diligent, or as the New King James says, um, give, at- does it say, give attention, is that what it says? Give attention to it. 
Give yourself wholly to it. May everyone see your progress. That's what an athlete does. They watch themselves closely. They progress themselves with charts. They measure themselves. And everybody sees it. And then finally, verse 16, the last verse. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life closely. Watch your doctrine closely. An athlete is always watching his health. He's charting himself. He's measuring himself. He's pushing himself. Now, did any of you guys here watch the Winter Olympics that were on just a few weeks ago? Those aren't the real Olympics, right? The, the summer ones are the real Olympics, right? That's what I used to think. Now, you know, now I really like the Winter Olympics, except for this one. I kind of boycotted this one, all right, because of all the stuff that was going on. But I did watch the, ja the Olympics in Japan, which is strange. It was in the same six or eight months because of all the weirdness going on in the world. Did you watch the J Japan Olympics? And it was at Sochi? Is that where it was? Yeah, I, I enjoy watching it. I watch these athletes. I'm amazed how, you know, somebody can be gold or silver, not by the difference of a second, but the f difference of a fraction of a second. It, it's amazing, you know, and how do you improve on that? Well, you just keep going and going and going. But here's the thing, the, all these Olympic athletes, they labor and strive for gold medals on earth. As Christians, we will one day receive something like golden crowns in heaven. Athletes want the whole world to see them standing up on the podium with those medals hanging around their necks. As believers, we're going to take our golden crowns and cast them at the feet of Jesus. There's a big difference. Earthly rewards are for a short season. You don't remember who the gold winners were back in 1963, do you? Nobody does. But here's the thing. Heavenly rewards will benefit you now and into eternity. Our goal is not to race against other Christians or to compare ourselves with other Christians. God doesn't measure you against your brothers and sisters. He measures you by what you could have done. And he rewards you. You know, why? I gave you this talent. What did you do to it? Did you bury it in the ground? Did you do nothing with it? It has different levels of fruitfulness, depending on what we do with it. Instead of coming in first, we are to come in as best we can with what God has given us. And for all of us, this is the goal of what it is, you know, to overcome our natural tendency to spiritual sloth. Listen to me, folks. My flesh does not want to do anything spiritual. Every morning I have to wake up and say, it's time to pray. It's time to read the word. It's... My flesh fights me. It does... My flesh does not want to pray. My flesh does not want to get into the word. My flesh doesn't want to come to church. I'm the pastor. My flesh does not want to witness. Right? It doesn't want to. I find reasons not to do it. And all I need is one little distraction. I'm gone. Whew. Just like that. Now, as you get older, you understand yourself better. And hopefully you get a handle on it. But here's what I want to leave you with. Make your life count for the gospel. With the little time that we've got left, make your time, make your treasure, and make your talents count for the Lord. We got just a little bit of a time, just a little bit of time left on this earth. Make it count for the Lord. So I leave you with that challenge and my prayer for you this morning. Uh, Cheryl's going to be at the back if you want to help sponsor a kid or missionary or find out more information or just become a, a partner um, on a monthly basis, whatever it is. But I want to pray for you this morning along with those 150 pastors that are praying for you this morning. Father, we come to you right now and uh, we thank you for every man, woman, and child in this uh, building, this property right now. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them richly. We pray you would encourage them. We pray, Lord, you would help us to get past our own spiritual struggles, our own spiritual sloth, our laziness. Lord, we need to just be immersed in grace, but then you call us to pick up our cross daily, to deny ourselves and follow you, to be like those spiritual athletes. Train yourself to be godly. 
exercise yourself to become like Jesus. I pray, Lord, that would be the reality for all of us this week. Speak to us by your Holy Spirit with this chapter this week. Sow these words to our heart. We pray they would bear fruit in Jesus' name. Amen.